at lab today, and then we have lectures on Tuesday, and sorry, Thursday, next Tuesday, and the lecture Thursday will be the last one. They'll be on the first exam, and the first exam is, is next Thursday. Okay, I'll talk more about it, but it's in class, open book, open notes. Um, but if you, well, we'll talk more about it. But, so I don't want you to have to memorize things, but if you don't know anything and you're hoping to find it in the book during the test, it won't work out well for you, okay? So we'll, we'll talk more about it. So what I'm going to do today is go over some, um, ma some more MATLAB stuff. Last time we introduced the idea of the statistics toolbox, and we're going to use more of that to do three different things <coughs> that we didn't do last time. First one is how you do hypothesis tests within MATLAB. Uh, second, second and third, really, is how you do both regression and correlation analysis. Like, you know, we've done all this stuff analytically, so I'm just teaching you how to do it in MATLAB. I think you'll appreciate it's a lot easier. Um, and the last thing I didn't actually talk about in detail, um, but I'm going to show you how to do it in MATLAB, something called response surface modeling. Linear regression is the simplest kind of response surface modeling, um, but you can also build models that have curvature and things like this. And, and MATLAB has a really nice tool to do this, and, and you're going to be using that tool <laughs> in the fourth homework, which, by the way, is posted. It's a MATLAB homework. It's liable to take a little more preparation than these homeworks in terms of time, so you probably don't want to wait until the last night to try to start it. Um, and I think the TA that's handling it already sent out a note. He already went through the whole thing, got, it, got everything working, presumably. And so if you have any direct questions on doing the homework, you send them to him, Jonathan, because he's the one handling the homework. Um, but this response service modeling tool is something that you'll use in that homework, and so I'll, I'll introduce it today. All right. I think you can, you can go now. Yeah, thanks. All right, so start with hypothesis tests. So there's, there's, MATLAB always does many, many more things than you probably want it to do or need it to do. So um, I rarely cover all the things it can do. I just try to make parallels between what MATLAB does and what we talked about in class so you can see how to do those things. So it, it has 17 different types of hypothesis tests. Um, the ones we're interested in um, that we talked about was the t-test. Okay, so right, this is, this is if you want to test whether a mean, you know, you want to do a hypothesis test on the mean, for example, we use the t-test, we've talked about that in the past, okay. So you want to do a test that, it, that a sam samples that come from a normal distribution have some mean versus the alternative, they have a lower mean or a higher mean or a different mean, okay. So that's a t-test for doing hypothesis testing on the mean. They have a function called var test, and that's to hypothesis testing um, on, the, on the variance. So that's using the chi-squared distribution. Again, that'd be a test if you want to test whether the variance, you know, the hypothesis that, that there's a certain variance, that's a null hypothesis, and you're testing against the um, possibility the variance is different, lower, higher. You can do any of the things you want, okay? <coughs> and I'll show you examples of both those. The chi-squared that they have little names here. The ch chi 2 gof means this, the chi-squared goodness of fit. Okay. I didn't really, t I used to cover that. We just didn't have time now. I'm not going to really talk about it, but I just wanted to mention it in this one line here. So this is a very nice tool because it, you can test whether samples actually come from a normal distribution. You remember in the central li limit theorem we said as long as you have enough samples, it's all good and you can just use tests for a normal distribution, but we didn't quantify how many was enough. And in many cases, the amount that you have will, will probably not be sufficient if the data doesn't come from a normal distribution. So, you know, if you use a test for a normal distribution and the data, a small data set's not normally distributed, you'll probably get bad answers. Okay, you'll still get answers, so you just, they won't be good. So this chi-squared goodness of fit function tests whether samples, it's a hypothesis test, it tests whether the samples actually come from a, dis, a normal distribution. Okay, so in other words, if you wanted to do tests that were for a normal distribution, the first thing you could do is take the samples, apply this chi-squared goodness of fit and see if they actually seem to have come from a normal distribution. If they seem to have come and the hypothesis passes, test passes, then you'd feel pretty good about using all the tests that we use for normal distributions. If not, you should probably be careful. So unfortunately, I don't have time to go over that, but I just want to mention that that is available. It's not that hard to use. You could do help, chi-squared, chi-squared actually, goodness of fit, and you could find it. Okay, so for the mean hypothesis test, um, so what I do in each of these cases, I tell you what the command looks like. I try to explain how to use. These are built-in functions in MATLAB, okay? So the way they work is you supply information on the right-hand side, all these arguments that are needed. 
and then MATLAB gives you back an answer. Okay, so these are just built-in functions as part of the statistics toolbox. So this mean hypothesis test, or more generally t-test, works like this, okay? You gotta supply the information over here. What is it? Data. So in other words, if you wanna do a t-test, you need samples. The samples are put into a vector. That vector is called, in this case, data. You can call anything you want, okay? It's called data here. M is the expected mean, right? You want to do a hypothesis test on the mean, you have to have a hypothesis what you think the mean is. That value is M. Alpha is the significance level. We talked about that a lot. We use 5 or 10% typically. And then this thing over here um, is what you would like the test to be. Remember we talked about left, left alternatives, right alternatives, or two-sided? So right, this is the case where you're worried that the, the mean is actually smaller than the hypothesized value. This is where you think it might be bigger, and this is where you're worried about it being either smaller or bigger, okay? So you put that argument here, and then um, well, I'll show you in a minute how to use it, okay? So it gives you back just one thing called H. You could call, you don't have to call that H. You, you understand this, right? You just have to give it in this way. <laughs> call it anything you want, but I call it H. So if it gives you back H <coughs> equals 1, that means you should reject the hypothesis. Right? The hypothesis is that the mean is equal to this value. If it comes back H equal 1, you reject that hypothesis that it's, that it's equal to that value. If it's 0, you accept it. Okay? So for example, let's say you had this data. Okay? So this is 10 values of molecular weight, obviously scaled to be around 1. Um, here's the mean and here's the variance of those samples. So my, here's my hypothesis that the mean is 1.3, okay? And I want to test that versus the alternative that the mean is actually less than that. So that, that's a left-handed test, right? What I don't show you here, but I appreciate, you, hopefully you can appreciate I need to do, is I need to put these 10 values in a vector called x, right? So I create a vector x, put these 10 values in it, and then issue this command. So this says, I'd like to do a t-test. All my data is in the vector x. I think the, the expected mean, hypothesized mean is 1.3. The significance level I've chosen to be 10%. And I'm going to do a left-handed test to test whether it might be less than that. It spits back this number, h equals 1. Okay? That means reject the hypothesis that the mean is that. Right? So in other words, this is the same thing I think we got when we did this analytically. So your hypothesis fails. You get the idea? Same, same thing we did analytically. Okay. You can do a test on the variance. It works very similarly. You gotta supply the data in some vector. You have what you think is the expected variance, okay? And then you have a significance level and then you can decide what kind of test you wanna do. All right? And it's the same kind of thing. Typically we'll be interested in the um, what right-handed test because we're worried about the possibility of variance is probably greater than we think not less but you can do it either way you want or any way you want and again same thing if you get back a one that means reject the hypothesis if it's if it comes back zero that means don't reject the hypothesis which means accept the hypothesis okay so let's say you took the same data set I gave you on the previous page right which is this here and you hypothesize that the, this mean is actually 0.0075. Okay, that's your hypothesis. And you're, you're worried in this case just to illustrate that the mean is anything that might be different than that. Okay? So then I issue this command here. Okay? So do the variance test. My data is in that vector as before. This is what I think the variance is, or that's on my hypothesized value. I'm going to do a 10% significance level, and I'm worried about it being either lower or smaller or larger in this case. Comes back h equals 0. Okay? That means accept the hypothesis. So in other words, based on the data you have, you, you, you can't say that the, the variance is not this value, even though the calculated value is that, right? So you can't reject the hypothesis, so yeah. So it's a little different than the one I did in, in the lecture notes, but I just changed this hypothesized value, that's all. Otherwise, it's the same as the lecture notes. All right. So, you know, this is much easier, right, than, you know, having to look up in the table and then calculate t statistics and compare them and things like this. So it's quite convenient to use. All right, linear regression, we talked about this. And you can do this easily in MATLAB. The command to do it looks like this, called regress. Um, and so the way one uses it is 
that you have two vectors, okay? So you have a y vector that contains all the dependent variable, right? We usually looking for an equation that looks like y equals like k0 plus k1 times x. So y, in order to do regression, we need pairs of y and x together, right? We have to have done experiments where we changed x and got the corresponding value of y and we put these in two vectors. The vectors with the output or the dependent variable information is in the vector y. Those with the um, independent variable information is in x. And there's one thing you have to do with x, <laughs> which is easiest to show you in an example. But x actually is not, it actually has two columns. The first column has to be all ones and the second column has to be the data that you collected. Otherwise, um, it'll, make the, uh, it'll make the intercept equal zero. So in other words, if you, if you just specify x just to be the value of the data you got, it'll force the intercept to be zero. If you want to have the possibility of having a non-zero intercept, you have to have a column of ones. I'll show you in a second, okay? Specify the confidence level. This is one minus alpha, okay? So in other words, if you want a 90% confidence le a level, then, this number, this, then you're going to specify 0.1, all right? And then what it's going to do is give you two pieces of information here. It's going to give you the, the values of the slope and the intercept in a vector called k. And then it's going to give you the confidence intervals in another vector called k int. All right. So let's see how this guy works. So here's some data. We did this one in class. So what we're trying to do here is we've done, a, let's say, a chemical reaction. We measured some reactant concentrations and then the corresponding reaction rates. And we wanted to develop a linear relationship between the concentration as the input and the rate as the output. All right. So we're going to take this data and put it into a vector. All the input data, right, the concentration of the inputs, I put that in some vector I call C. And I create some, all the rate information, the eight experiments, I put that in some vector called R. All right. Now, if you read the fine print, which I tried to explain, it said you, you need to create, um, sorry, I'm going back. This thing has to have two columns. The first column has to be all ones, and the second column has to be the data that you want. Okay. So this was my goal, was to create this vector here, right? So this is a matrix. The first column is all ones, and the second column is the data here for the inputs, right? See, that's, that is just the column. How did I create that? I issued this command here, okay? So what this, I don't know if I introduced this thing yet, probably not yet, but what this thing does is it creates vectors or matrices of all ones. So what this command says is please, so I'm trying to create a, a matrix here with two columns. That's the first column and that's the second column. The first column it says, please make a column with all ones and have the length of that column be the same as the dimension of C, right? Because I want, I want to have the same number of elements of ones as I have a C. So rather than count like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then put eight there, I can just say length of the vector C and it'll automatically know the right length, okay? So that creates a, a, something that has every row is a one and the number of rows is the length of C, which is eight, and there's only one column. So that creates the one there. And then you take this guy, which is a row vector, and you put a prime there, that makes it a column vector. Okay, so that's, that's what you need. I call that thing C aug, means augmented matrix or augmented vector, whatever you want to call it, okay? All right. So now we have the data we want here. We have the data we want here to use the command and I have to issue it like this, okay? All right, so this might be a little confusing here, but okay, so I'm using this regress command. The first thing is I need to have the dimensions of this thing match the dimensions of this. So the way I wrote R is it's a, ro it's a row vector, right? So I'm going to make it R prime so it's a column vector because I wrote these all as column vectors, okay? So that's why I have R prime instead of R. If you use something MATLAB doesn't like, it'll spit back a message that says something like the dimensions are not consistent in this argument here. And that means you got to do something else, okay? So that, that just makes R a row vector. That is the, the vector or the matrix X I had on the previous page, right? First column, all ones. I should have just put C aug right there. I forgot to, sorry. I could do it now, but that, that, that would be the smart thing to do. Just call that C aug. But anyway, same thing. So there's the output data. There's the input data. First row, all ones. Second, sorry. First column, all ones. Second column, the data. 
I want to have a 95% confidence level, so I pick this to be 0.05 because that's the way it wants to do it. And then you issue this command and it spits back this information. Okay. First thing is the intercept, right? If, if in other words, if I didn't include this and I just included this data as a single vector, it would, it would force this to be zero. But, so it calculates this intercept and that's the 95% confidence levels on the intercept. In the lecture, I didn't actually teach you how to compute confidence levels on the intercept, just the slope, but you can easily do them in MATLAB. Okay. So what does that tell you? Remember, I went through this whole spiel uh, on the board and I, and I asked the question, well, is that thing statistically different from zero? Because we actually expect if you have no reactant, there'll be no rate, right? So this says, well, you can see we have a 95% confidence 95% uh, confidence that the intercept somewhere in the region, which includes zero. Okay, so that makes you feel like, okay, even though I got a value that's not zero based on physical considerations, zero is probably, you know, it's in there, so it's pretty reasonable. If zero was not in these confidence, in this 95% confidence interval, you'd be pretty concerned probably, because you'd probably say something's wrong with your data. Okay. All right, and this is the same thing we calculate in class. There's the slope of the line, and there's the 95% confidence intervals, lower and higher. Okay? So quite, quite easy to use. Just got to learn how to do this trick of making the column of ones. But All right, so that's linear regression. All right, to do correlation analysis, you issue this command. Okay, so you have two vectors, x and y, right? And you're trying to establish if there's a correlation between x and y. You've done a series of experiments just like before. And so here's an example. I'll come back in a second. So, right, we did this in class. We, we have a polymer reactor. And I argued before, you might want to change the hydrogen concentration because that's something called a chain transfer agent. And that will change the lengths of the chains of this polymer, but shouldn't change the amount of polymer made, just the lengths of the chains. So, you, based on physical considerations, you think that hydrogen shouldn't affect the polymerization rate. It should affect the molecular weight, but not the amount of polymer made, okay? So you change the hydrogen concentration, collected this data, and now you want to see if these things are uncorrelated. That's what you expect based on physical arguments. So that's the input data, and that's the output data. That's X, that's Y, okay? And then you simply issue this command. It gives you back a matrix of correlation coefficients. It's actually not that exciting. Well, half of it's not exciting. So it gives you a two by two correlation matrix because it's going to give you You'll see it in a minute. Well, I, I'll just show you the answer. So it gives you something like this, okay? So the first thing is, what's X correlation with itself? One. What's Y's correlation with itself? One. It always is, okay? And then it gives you the actual correlation coefficient you care about. So this is the only thing you care about. So it's a matrix for whatever reason. MATLAB gives you a whole matrix, only one element of which you care about. Because it's repeated and the other elements of, are going to be one by definition, okay? So that's what I'm just saying here. The correlation of coefficient is in the off-diagonal elements of this matrix. Okay. And then the p-value gives you, um, is what you use for hypothesis testing. Okay. So you, you know the thing with the correlation coefficient. So you see something like, okay, the correlation is, coefficient is 0.62. Okay. That's what we're going to get for this example. That's what we also got in the lecture. So then the question is, is that really different than zero? It might be, is it 0.62 because there's actually a correlation or is it 0.62 because we just don't have enough data? That's what you're, you're trying to figure out, distinguish those two, okay? So this p-value gives you the, you can use this for hypothesis testing, okay? So it says each p-value is the probability of getting a correlation as large as the observed one, okay? So the idea here is if you, you look at this correlation coefficient and it doesn't, it works a little different than the other things, but let's say you wanted um, a 90 or a 5% significance level, okay? So if this correlation, if this number, this probability is above 0.5, then you conclude they're not correlated. It d so you have to judge this according to what you specify to be the significance level, right? So if this thing, if you have 0.5, for example, that's what is implied here, 5% significance level, if you get back this probability and it's greater than 0.05, then you don't think there's a correlation. But if it's actually less than that number, and that's the number you want, then you think it is correlated. So let's, let's look at the example. I think it's easier to see. So I take this data, H, put it in a vector, put the data, P, in a vector, 
and what are there's eight different elements here. I issue this command, I get back this information, okay? This is not interesting as I explain correlation of x with itself and y with itself. That's the correlation coefficient, okay? All right. So then I get back this information, which again, there's only one value of any interest to us, okay? Which is this value here. So that is this probability that they're talking about right here, okay? So the idea here is if you were had a 5% significance level, in other words, 0 0.05, this number is above 0 0.05. So you'd say based on that significance level, these things are uncorrelated. However, if your significance level was 10%, then, it would, then this number is less than 0 0.1, you'd say they are correlated. Right? Whether you conclude something's correlated or not depends on the, the significance level. So this is kind of a nicer, I think this is nicer than the way we do it analytically because analytically you just get, you know, you calculate the C and T values and compare them. In this case, you get the actual probability. And you can see that, um, you know, for example, if you had a 10% significance level that you conclude they're correlated, but just barely, right? Just barely correlated. I mean, you should, I shouldn't say they're just barely correlated. You just barely conclude that, <laughs> okay? So you can use this to um, conclude, do any kind of correlation analysis you might like, quite easy. Okay. So this is the last thing, and I'm going to have you do a little exercise at the end. Um, so let's say you were in a, we're going to talk more about this tomorrow. Tomorrow we're talking about design of experiments. And the idea of, about design of experiments is that you have, a, let's say, a process, okay? And your process has lots of handles. What do I mean by handles? Let, let me go to this example here, okay? So this is, an, this is actually a system that exists in polymer science over there in LGR, well not, not, it's in Conti actually. So it's a polymer reactor, right? And so this polymer reactor is a so-called copolymerization system. So it takes two monomers and reacts those to make a polymer that's, com that's comprised of these two monomers. So typical thing is this is like ethylene and this is like propylene. And so you're going to get these long polymer chains that have, you know, alternating or blocks of ethylene and, and propylene together. It gives, the, it gives the polymer different properties, okay? All right, so in this case, you want to operate this reactor um, to make polymer, and you have some certain goals, okay? So the things that you can change are the amount of each of the monomers. You have two of them, like this might be ethylene and propylene. You can change the concentrations of those two things going into the reactor, okay? You can change the temperature of the reactor, and if you guys ever done any catalyst, you, you, you guys do that in freshman chemistry? So most reactions of industrial interest don't happen by themselves. You need to catalyze them, right? You have to have something that makes that reaction want to take place, lowers the activation energy for the reaction. Those things are called catalysts, right? They're not consumed in the reaction. They catalyze the reaction. So this particular technology for making these things actually has two catalyst species. These two, these two guys are put in the reactor, they get together, form a complex, and then they catalyze the addition of these little monomers to a growing polymer chain, okay? The bottom line, though, is you can change these. So you can change the amount of each of the two catalysts, each of the two monomers in temperature. So five things you can change, okay? And the idea here is that you would like to have specify values of each of these five things to, for example, get the molecular weight, right? The polymer, you know, unlike, so if you have ethylene, if someone says I have ethylene, the only thing that matters is the concentration of ethylene, right? But if you have a polymer, there's lots of properties that matter to someone that uses a polymer, and so you can alter these properties with these five things, the two concentrations of the monomers, two concentrations of the catalyst, and temperature. Okay, so let's say you were running this, like it's a pilot plant, right? And someone said, we need you to adjust these five things such that you make enough polymer, it has the right composition. By composition, it means it has the right amount of ethylene and the right amount of propylene, and also has certain molecular weight characteristics that we need. They, so they, they set you loose in that you have this pilot plant, okay? Because this is a new product for a new customer, and the first thing the customer wants to know is, can you make it in a pilot plant, and then give me some, and I'll test it, and if I like it, we'll, I'll contract you to make a lot of it for me, okay? Um, and so you're working a pilot plant and they ask you to make this. The question is, how are you going to go about figuring out how to do this, okay? Like one way to do it is just randomly pick these five things, do an experiment, figure out what you get, and then randomly pick them again. 
Each experiment takes a couple of days because one day you do the experiment, one day to clean up. So, you know, you can do three or four experiments a week. So they don't want the answer in like a year. <laughs> right. So the question is like, how do you search over these different inputs to get the output you want in some efficient way? That's called experimental design. Okay. That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Once you get this data set, these large data sets, which we're going to play with a little data set here if I shut up soon, um, that you can do the so-called regression modeling. Okay. So, so the idea here is that this is the extension of a linear model if you have more than one input, right? If you just had one X and one Y, this would look pretty familiar to you. This just says I have maybe three inputs and one output. And so I think the output of interest is a linear combination of the three inputs. Okay, that's called a linear regression model. Okay. You could also have a linear model with so-called interactions. So in the case where you think a linear model is not um, sufficient, you might include these so-called interaction terms. Hopefully I don't have typos in here. And so this says, I have my linear part, right? But then I think there's some nonlinear interaction between X1 and X2. In other words, the effects of X1 and X2 are not purely linear. But like if both X1 and X2 go up at the same time, it has a greater effect than I would predict if it was linear. So you have this kind of bilinear term, okay? And if that's not enough, then you can include these quadratic terms. This is called a quadratic model that in includes um, squares of each of these variables, okay? These things are all called regression models. You don't know these coefficients beta. None, none of the, you don't know any of these betas, right? So when you guys do linear regression, the first thing you assume is there's one input and one output and you want to find beta zero and beta one, right? So this is a generalization of that idea to more than one input and also for models that may not be linear in the inputs, all right? That's called regression modeling. You get data to build these models by doing experimental design or design of experiments, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But let's just say we've done this, okay? Then there's this really nice tool in MATLAB that I'll have you play around with. Everyone knows what a GUI is? It means a graphical user interface, okay? It's not like gum underneath the seat or anything. So it's, it's something that you can open up. It's unlike most tools in MATLAB, it's actually an interface that you can interact with and um, do this response surface modeling, okay? I could read all this to you, but what I'm going to do is show you how to use it. Um, so this gives an explanation of how to use it. And then, but I think it's easier just to start playing around with it and show you how things work, okay? Um, so again, this is the problem I'm going to have you deal with. There's the problem statement I already gave you. And to do this little exercise that I'm going to have you do or I'm going to do along with you, or you're going to do along with me perhaps, you need this spreadsheet, okay? That spreadsheet again is on the course website I checked. So you got to go get that, you got to go get that um, data set now. Okay, go get the data set reactordata.xls which is posted at the same place as the lecture. And then you'll see what, the, what is that data set has is it's got 27, the results supposedly, of 27 different experiments that have different combinations of those five inputs. Okay. And tomorrow I will show you how we pick those 27 experiments. Right, like we had a reason why we did the 27 we did, okay? You imagine with five variables, you could do thousands of experiments. So we picked 27 according to some rationale that I'll explain tomorrow. So 27 combinations, the inputs, then all these things here, okay, are for each of the 27 experiments are reported, okay? Uh, but we're actually going to just do the analysis to make life simple for the first one. So this is a case where you have, let's say, one output of interest and five inputs. Okay? All right. So, here's how you want to start. So, you need to go get this spreadsheet. And if you do go get this spreadsheet, whoops. Okay, so I read the spreadsheet into a vector called data because that's what I wanted to do. And then you see all the data. It's too big to easily print out. Okay, but if you look at the top, the very top row is which experiment you're talking about. One, two, three, four. So there's 27 of those experiments. The second 
thing here is what the value of each of the inputs is. Each of the inputs has been scaled, okay, to be between minus two and two for reasons I'll explain tomorrow, okay? Minus two means the lowest level we're interested in, two means the highest level we're interested in, okay? So this is all five inputs. I forget which order they're in exactly, but there's five inputs. So four of them are at their lowest value and the fifth one is at their highest value, okay? And then these are the corresponding values of the outputs. They're also, also been scaled. So this is like the production rate. This would be the um, content of ethylene, I think, and these are two molecular weight measures, okay? But the bottom line is done one experiment here with, all, with a combination of five inputs, done the experiment, measured the four outputs, did another experiment with different combination measure, did this 27 times. That alone would take 54 days, okay, to get all the data. Okay, so then the question is, what can you do with this kind of data that you have? So, anytime I load in a vector, even though I can see the dimensions here, I'm never satisfied with that. I'm not sure why. So I check out the size, so I can see if I can understand what the hell this is. So 27, I'm right, I have 10 rows and 27 columns. So 27, I'm concluding, is the number of experiments. And then I have 10 rows, right, because the first row is which experiment, the next five rows are the inputs, and the last five, four rows are the inputs, uh, outputs. So that's why I have 10 rows, okay? So if I want to do the analysis just on... What I need to do to use the regression tools, I have to split this matrix into the inputs in one vector and the output of interest in, in another vector. And that's what this command right, th this series of commands right here does. <coughs> see, I only know how to issue this command because I looked at, took a look at the data to see what it looked like, so I figured it out, okay. The first command says, please take the big matrix called data and I want to call something called X. It's going to be the, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth rows, all columns. That's all the input data, right? So if you look at what you get with X, it's up here. The, 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 the row corresponds to which um, input you're talking about and there's 27 columns because there's 27 experiments. So X contains all the input data, okay? I issue this command for Y, okay? This says, Please put into Y the seventh row, all columns. That's all the polymer rate data, okay? And if you look up here, you'll see that's, that's what you got. So, so you have this big matrix that has all the data in it. The first row is useless because it just tells you what experiment. So I take the next five rows, which are the inputs, put that in a matrix called X, and then I put, um, take the next row, which is the polymer rate data, and put it in a vector called Y, okay? So now that I got those things, I can issue this command. And when I issue this command and something exciting happens, I'm hoping everyone will make an ooh sound. Okay, because this will be the first time MATLAB has ever done anything nice to you. All right. Yeah, see? I'm beyond excited about this. All right. So you might say, that looks cool, but I have no idea what it means. All right, so what this is, is um, it's done the regression for you already. It's built a linear model for you, okay? And so these are the five inputs down here. I forget the order of these, I'm sorry, but I guess this is the concentration of one monomer, the second monomer, monomer, catalyst, co-catalyst, temperature. Remember, they're all scaled to be between minus two and two. So right now, it's giving you a plot. So this is the regression line.